Diddly Star Bum Wars Bum Diddly Star Wars Bum Diddly Star Bum Wars Battles in Space. Chapter 2 opens on the moment where Poe Dameron is like, ah! And then Kylo Ren goes like, ah, and there's like a laser going, in the sky. Now in my Force Awakens movie review, I said that there were some comedy moments, which although most of the comedy moments in the film I found genuinely funny in a way that I haven't done in a Star Wars film in a very, very long time. Possibly ever. Have I ever laughed at anything in the original trilogy? No, I don't think so. Okay, so for the first time ever, Star Wars made me laugh, the funny bits were genuinely funny. But I said that there were a few that felt a little bit, and I think the phrase I used was, descended from Joss Whedon. If not actually feeling like they were written by him, then at least feeling as if they came from the kind of, I don't know, the kind of school of comedy writing that he began. Now I realise that that's a bit of a flimsy thing to say, so I ought to say something a bit more robust about it, so that, you know, anybody knows what I was on about there. And this is one of the moments that I meant. This, who talks first? Do I talk first? I'm not saying it was rubbish, I'm not saying it brought the film down in any way. I'm just saying it's gonna date very quickly. This is how people do comedy in films and on TV right now. It's tricky to trace it back to its actual source, but if you want an example of it, then modern Doctor Who is chock full of it. And if you want a good example, well then Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man does it all the time. Maybe that's why I made the Whedon connection, although he was doing it in the original Iron Man movie before Whedon got on the Avengers train, and honestly, it's in that first Iron Man movie that, that really I think is the time when it worked. I suspect when I made my comment I was following the line that goes through Doctor Who and then back into Buffy, where the focus is on saying things quickly and in ways that feel unexpected and twisty, but immediately decipherable anyway, and Joss Whedon had a knack for that, although I think he may have lost it more recently. Certainly in the most recent thing of his that I watched, it felt as if, uh, with a lot of the dialogue, presenting ideas in a, in a weird order for stylistic purposes had become like the main point of the screenplay, and the reason for saying things kind of got lost among all the quippy snappiness. But anyway, here we have a light example of it, saying the same thing over and over again quickly. It's just something that comedy does right now. I'm not saying that it ruined it. it felt fine to me, but that's because I'm native to this era where that's how people talk in order to be funny in films. And the odd thing is though that stylistically the rest of the film wasn't like this, so those moments felt like a modern film kind of peeping its head out from inside a film that's otherwise trying hard to appear to be from a time before these trends took over. You see, see what I mean? It's just a stylistic clash. Most of the dialogue feels like it's from Star Wars and then suddenly now we're in Friends. But it's okay, I just think that in ten years it's gonna feel dated the way that like the CG in Phantom Menace does, but, but nothing in the original Star Wars really does. I suppose maybe the film stock, maybe some of the costumes being a bit flimsy or whatever. And then here on page 24 is the first appearance of Captain Phasma, who I'm going to be keeping an eye on in the book to see if more is done with her in here than was done in the film. In the movie I got the sense she was only really in it as sort of set up so that when she comes back in later films we can see that she was set up right from the beginning, as, I believe, the personal adversary for Finn. After all, it's clear that she knew him and was his commanding officer, meaning that it's on her head when he defects and causes all the trouble for the First Order that he does. So she'll be hunting him across the galaxy before long, which is going to be a well cool, like a Boba Fett, but who we actually get to see hunting somebody. Now that's the other side to Phasma's curious absence from the film, of course. I joked at the time that her whole involvement might be a tribute to Boba Fett. Show up so briefly that you have to be invested in the character already from the marketing and so on to even notice they're there. Say two lines max and then fall down a hole. But hey, who knows, maybe that is actually deliberately what they were going for. I don't know, we'll have to see if she comes back in the next film. Now on this page, page 24, Foster has to deal with the fact that in the film a lot of the storytelling is done with camera work. Of course he wouldn't have known that from the screenplay, but it's how it eventually turned out, so I assume that the screenplay was heavier on the we see this, we see that. In the movie we see Finn hesitate and not shoot the villagers, clearly shocked by the horror of what he's been ordered to do. Well the problem in the book is he hasn't even got a name at this point, so Foster has to figure out how to reintroduce him to the scene, having, you know, we've seen him before, but now he has to mention that stormtrooper I mentioned before but didn't tell you who he was, he has to kind of work around that, so it's not as visceral, it's slightly less clear in the book than it was in the film. But that's a testament to, I think, some really fine camera work and direction in the film. In this chapter, Foster seems to be drawing some amount of attention to the fact that Kylo Ren is letting people go who, if he was like a, that strong of a force user and could see into the future or what have you, he would know he needs to deal with these people because they're going to be a thorn in his side. He actively orders his soldiers not to harm to even harm Poe Dameron, and he catches sight of Finn, he sees it eye to eye, and then he just ignores him, doesn't think anything of it. Now this last is a huge oversight, given what, you know, the First Order has to put up with as a result. It's kind of like that moment in the original Star Wars where the two guys let the shuttle go, and all of their problems come from the fact that there were C-3PO and R2-D2 on that shuttle. Maybe this is another one of those little moments. A lot of people really hated the moments where it reflected stuff from the original films, but 
just whatever. You know, if you if you decide to settle into that and allow it to happen and look for references and have fun spotting them, then you're going to have, I think, a better time. But anyway, maybe this is actually our first clue, highlighted in the book, but possibly present in the film, I, don't, I can't really remember, that Kylo Ren is not actually that great of a Force user, at least not as much as he thinks. Next time you watch the film, I'll try and remember this as well, but next time you watch the film, see if, in this scene, Kylo Ren actually looks at Finn and notices him, but then moves on. Because in the book, he does. I've watched it again now, and I can confirm that this absolutely happens in the film, and so, yes, it is a thing. In fact, it's even more highlighted in the film than it is here, perhaps. So then Kylo turns round and stalks off back to his shuttle, and on the way, he uses the Force to lift up Poe Dameron's gun, which is lying on the ground behind him, and just smash it against the wall, which is cool. Uh, is that in the film? Don't remember. Interestingly, this is different and more interesting in the film. In the film, he releases the hovering laser beam, which blasts into something. Now, I'm trying to keep track this time of, like, how characters are led from one scene to the next, because uh, a lot of the reviews of the film were like, well, that was a bit handy that the characters happened to go to exactly the place, you know, where they're needed next for the story. So I'm keeping track of exactly what justification the book gives, because it, you know, necessarily has to, because it's, you know, going into slightly more detail, as to why characters think of going to the next place. So it's worth mentioning here that the stormtroopers blow up Poe Dameron's X-Wing and BB-8 sees that explosion and that causes him to sort of roll off in another direction. Well yeah, plus he's under direct orders from Poe Dameron to get as far away as he possibly can. Next scene on page 26 is Poe Dameron being escorted through the Star Destroyer. Apparently the order to keep him unharmed hasn't really done much to improve Poe's estimations of how he's gonna get on today. He's already thinking that they're probably gonna start dismembering him soon. And then Finn breaks away and we have that moment where he takes off his helmet and then is reprimanded for it by Captain Phasma. Now in the book he takes his helmet off to throw up because he was so sort of shaken by what he's seen. I seem to remember at the cinema thinking that it was a fairly transparent uh, opportunity to just show John Boyega's face. But now on page 27 we move on to our introduction to Rey and the very first words used to describe her are for whom daring was as much a sense as sight or hearing. Little clue there, maybe. Now I've forgotten this, the very first thing we see her do is scale a wall, which of course is, you know, what she has to do later to some much greater effect. And it's one of the clues that people have been latching onto to suggest that she might be a Kenobi, not a Skywalker, which is a theory I'm quite fond of. Not so much that, like, clambering about on things is a, is a Kenobi family trait, but just that in the original film there was that scene of Obi-Wan sort of climbing around on the Death Star. Maybe not climbing, but sneaking and clambering about a bit. And that's mirrored quite strongly in the equivalent scene with Rey later on on the uh, Death Star. And, uh, and you know, mirrored scenes are one of, the, one of the tools on this film's belt. Well, the book has her clambering about in this sort of, essentially like a rubbish tip made out of giant scale bits of broken metal, iron and scraps, but on a huge scale with her clambering about on these giant walls. Now, perhaps I wasn't paying attention, but I, I thought, my memory of that scene was that I thought she was inside the wreckage of that Star Destroyer or something similar, but maybe I'm just mixing it up with the bit where she flies through later on. But like, I thought what it was at the time was that that scene shows how familiar she is with the Star Destroyer and that that's one interpretation of how she's able to fly the ship through it. But actually, you know, we're being sort of deflected away from the fact that it's actually just she's using the force. So here's a moment from the film that I'd forgotten then. I suspect I hadn't really settled into the general shape of what it was I was watching yet. I wasn't really taking things in, but I remember this as a sort of a montage of daily life for Ray. Possibly I was too busy, possibly I was too busy trying not to see this as yet another one of those kinds of genre story that I tend not to enjoy. The ones where we're invited to imagine how we could possibly survive at all in the harsh environment we've been shown characters surviving in, and to realise that well, we wouldn't survive, and so by comparison to realise how impressive it is that the character uh, is surviving. But my problem with things like that is that usually once I've realised that I, and like anyone I know, wouldn't survive here, now now, all I'm thinking about isn't like how impressive this person is for managing it, but how even they realistically wouldn't manage it every day, like every day of their life. Here we're shown an environment where if Ray doesn't manage every single day to salvage enough stuff to pay for enough food to survive, which is really, like, hard to do. It's really expensive, the guy isn't very generous with his rations that he gives out. Plus, it's a sweltering desert, she's gonna be exhausted all the time, you know, there's, there's the question mark over whether or not she eats every day. And if she doesn't salvage enough and she doesn't get enough rations, then what, in a desert? You're not gonna survive. One bad day and you're dead, and she's managed to survive into adulthood. And never mind that, what about everyone else that we see here? I mean, maybe it's possible that every single person on the planet Jakku is an amazing badass. I'm certainly prepared to accept that they'd be better at surviving here than I would. But once you're looking at odds like that, it's all I can concentrate on. Like, you might as well convince me to believe in a story where everyone on the planet has to win the lottery every day, or they die. Why is there anyone left? 
You know, why did the settlement here last longer than a generation? Now, I first talked about that in my review of Dune, because Dune, 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 is an example of not this. In Dune, Herbert explains very clearly how everyone managed to survive. It's almost the main thing the book does. And I came out perfectly satisfied. And then meanwhile, in the original Star Wars, well, they were moisture farmers, so they had a living, and they had access to the thing that you need to survive in a desert. So they were great, although it does raise questions about how everyone who isn't a moisture farmer managed to live on Tatooine, and if there's, you know, maybe everyone's moisture farmers there and they all sell to outside, but that doesn't seem like, that, that doesn't seem like a sensible economy. Well, anyway, here, for Rey to survive one day, there has to be enough salvage somehow appearing in the places that she's already picked clean over the last 20 years or how long it's been. And she has to work, apparently without food or water, for most of the day, and, and until it's collected. You know, they go as far as to show her, like, trying to get the last drops of water out of her little thing that she has of water, and, and it's not, and it's not coming, because there isn't any. And it's, oh, it's so frustrating to watch that sort of thing, and so many genre fiction things want to do it. How could they survive? What is the local industry and economy? Careful there, Dave. This is exactly the wrong way to look at Star Wars. This is what I've had to come to terms with here. As soon as we start trying to make sense of it all, it collapses. Not, not, not in the way where it's like, oh, it falls apart because it's shoddily written, but no, because because that's Star Wars, that's the point of it. I can't quite remember who said it, it might have been the story and Star Wars lectures over on Story Wonk, and if not, well they're just worth listening to anyway. But whoever it was, they said that if you try and apply Star Trek rules to Star Wars, try and make it in, into something that scientifically uh, basically makes sense, or at least there's a way of explaining it, you're being silly, because that's not the kind of story that, that we're looking at here. We're looking at close relative of fairy tales, basically. The actual, like, how does this work is secondary to the emotional point of it. And in this case, the emotional point of it is that she has a hard life of hardship, and we're supposed to not want her to be there. We're meant to feel uncomfortable and unhappy with her lifestyle, and want her to get out. Great, done. On page 33, she scratches her tally mark into the wall. I remember thinking at the time that this was probably counting the days that she was trapped either on the planet or doing this particular kind of job, but now I realise she's counting the days that her family haven't come back for her. Which is more or less the same thing, but it isn't quite, because again, we're looking at this in terms of like the emotional message it's sending, and what it's saying here is that, yeah, she's trapped, but in a trap of her own making, essentially. She can leave, she hates being here, and she wishes she could leave, but every time someone says to her, why don't you leave, we find out that she has essentially imposed this imprisonment on herself, because she's waiting for her family to get back. She could leave at any time, if only she felt free to do so. Like, like Obi-Wan at the beginning of A New Hope. On page 34, we find out that they don't know much about the First Order here. There was that occasional mention in the market of a rising new power in the galaxy, an organisation that called itself the First Order, determined, relentless. Nobody seemed to know much else about it. Not something to worry about here, she knew. Whatever it was, whatever it represented, it wouldn't come to this backward, out-of-the-way world. Nobody came to Jakku. And then it goes, she was alone. So it's tying that nobody comes to Jakku in with the fact that she's waiting for her parents. So there's a little detail there. But anyway, we know that they've heard of the First Order here, so it's big enough, but they don't know what it is. So it obviously isn't the galaxy-spanning power that, you know, the Empire was. And then she follows a sound to where she meets BB-8, being restrained by that guy riding that thing. We learn that the guy is a Tido, and the thing is a Lugger Beast. Quite a good name. I don't remember what causes her to free BB-8 from the Tito in the film. I assume it's just that, you know, it's just fairly clearly shown as a visual cue that Tito's are bad news and she should probably prevent one from putting anything in her sack. Well, Foster gives us a version of the same idea here. He starts off by saying that, like, if anything is going on on Jakku that you don't understand, it's probably bad. And the best thing to do is to stop it until you can figure out what's going on. And in this case, what happens on page 35 is that she gets sworn at a lot by the Tito. So she decides to just place herself firmly, like, against whatever it is that it's trying to do. So what's the point of this scene? Well, it shows that Rey is tough. It gives her an opponent, and okay, there's not a fight, which we'll see that later, but in this particular case, it, some stuff just runs away from her without even a fight. She scares it away with just, like, a bit of shouting and a flash of a knife. She belongs here, in other words. She isn't, like, an audience surrogate character who is a bit of a fish out of water, a gentle person stuck in a world she doesn't understand. No, she she belongs here. She's not one of us. She's one of the people of this planet. There's a nice moment where BB-8 starts beeping at the, uh, at the Tito, and she shushes it, trying to prevent something from kicking off. And then, on page 36, something I'd forgotten about that's rather nice. Knowing the rest of the film's story and the online response to it, this, I appreciate this bit a lot more now. This is the bit where Ray tells BB-8 that details about where she comes from are classified and a big secret. 
Well, she isn't kidding, is she? I mean, speculation about her family and, like, who she is and where she comes from, that's one of the internet's favourite pastimes even now, which is, what, a month after it was released? Possibly more by the time you see the video. And to add to all that, I don't, I don't remember if this is in the film or not, but she introduces herself. Here we are. This is her talking to BB-8. Yes, there's a lot of sand here. BB-8? Okay, hello, BB-8. My name is Ray. No. Just Ray. I've got to say, it actually didn't strike me until a little while after I saw the film that you never hear a second name for Ray, which I realise is, is totally obvious because the whole thing is that we don't know who she is. But what I mean is, we do hear what sounds like a second name for Kylo Ren. And yeah, later on we find out about the Knights of Ren, and maybe they're his knights, or maybe they all call themselves something Ren, you know, like Darth something. But just Ray, you know, and just Finn, these are weird names for characters in Star Wars. Up until now, just about every Star Wars character I can think of, every Star Wars character I can think of, except for two, have two names. Han, Solo, Luke, Skywalker. And you refer to them by that. Okay, we don't usually call Leia Leia Organa, but we do usually call her Princess Leia. And that's got the same kind of cadence as, as a first name and a second name. The only main cast character I can think of with just a single name is Chewbacca, and that's so syllable heavy that you don't really notice. In fact, it's the same number of syllables as Han Solo. And the other one, the only other character I can think of right now, is Yoda. And the whole point of that name is to be completely impenetrable, you know, before we know who he is. It's meant to be a total mystery who Yoda is going to be. So maybe that's what's going on here. You know, we've got Rey, just Rey, a mystery, an enigma. But also we have Finn, who certainly by the end of the film feels like he's not supposed to be as mysterious as Rey is, but, well, perhaps he is. And then the chapter ends with Rey and BB-8 sort of walking and rolling off across the dunes, uh, basically on, on bad terms. She's begrudgingly allowing the little droid to roll along beside her, but she doesn't like it and she doesn't want it. Now, I can't remember if this is actually portrayed in the film or not, but it is reminiscent, isn't it, of C-3PO and R2-D2 at the start of A New Hope. Except, of course, it was clear by the end of the first film that this was all bluster from C-3PO and that actually he does care about R2-D2. But the point is, you've got these two figures, one tall and humanoid, one an R2-D2, walking along the sand dunes and sort of sort of bickering, or at least the one that we can understand is bickering at the one we can't. Now in this one it's quite explicitly clear that the little one is trying to be friendly, and he very much gives us the impression of a baby R2-D2. But I, what we're being shown here again, everything shows you something, and here we're being shown Ray. She's just made of sterner stuff. All right, well, that's us for chapter two of The Force Awakens. Uh, join me next time when... What happens next time? Let's find out, because I, I actually haven't read ahead. Oh, yes, yes. Ray is going to try and sell BB-8 to the guy who gives her the rations. Not a terrifically interesting scene, and I wonder if uh, Foster is going to do anything to sort of put a bit of extra life into that. Because if he doesn't, without the presence of Daisy Ridley, is it? That scene may well drag. We shall find out. And also... Aha! Yes, great. Poe and Finn are going to meet in the next chapter, so... Uh, looking forward to how that's handled. All right, uh, bye then. See you for the next chapter then.